welcome back again to my channel and now I'm going to watch a video called Fate Lore, The Tale of Arturia Pendragon by Otaku Daikun. So let's check it out. Oh, I really love this theme song. <laughs> Britain is an island ruled by royalty under the great king Uther Pendragon. Merlin, a youthful looking, mysterious and powerful mage, serves under him. The state of Britain at this time is troubling. The Saxons, overseas foreigners, demand land and gain influence from the struggle between Britain's families. One such noble is Vortigern, the usurper, who schemes the demise of his own nation. Vortigern possesses great might, imbued with the essence of the White Dragon. Britain is doomed to ruin unless something drastic can be done. In order to create an ideal ruler for Britain's next king, Uther consults Merlin, and they work together to ensure Uther's next child will transcend humanity. They set out to give rise to a child imbued with the essence of the Red Dragon, who can thwart Vortigern. For this, they need a woman of noble blood, one Uther can impregnate with Merlin's magical influence, sealing a dragon's power into a single human. The woman most compatible with this procedure is Lady Egraine. Though she is already married to Gorlo, the Duke of Cornwall, one of Uther's trusted retainers. This conflict makes Uther and Gorlo enemies, and to circumvent this, Merlin uses his power to disguise Uther as Gorlo, so that he may infiltrate enemy territory and make love to Egraine. Oh. The child is born, a girl <laughs> named Artoria. Due to her sex, she cannot be reared as a future king, so she's entrusted to Merlin who is still confident that she will fulfill her destiny regardless. During battle, Uther is defeated by Vortigern, fleeing the land and sending Britain into the Dark Ages. Merlin assures the people of Britain that there is still hope, that Uther is hiding an heir who will be the once and future king of Britain. And so the people wait ten more years for their new king. Age of five, Artoria is placed in care of an honorable knight, Sir Ector, and his son, Sir Kay, to be brought up as a proper knight. The young Artoria serves as a squire to Sir Kay, under Ector's guidance. She takes care of their horses, Eto in particular, and trains in sword fighting. Sir Kay is well aware that Artoria is a woman, but is expected to guide her as his brother. Artoria is led to believe that Kay is related to her by blood, and even after learning the truth, she views him as a troublesome older brother. When she duels, she's a sore loser, stubbornly upset by her own weakness. Even though she frequently wins in their sword bouts, she feels she is still defeated in the arguments she has with Kay during their training. While harsh, the two truly do act like genuine siblings. One day, Artoria falls ill, and Kay is the only one around to tend to her. He tells her, It would be troublesome for me if you were to die now, and vows to fulfill her every request. After some persistence, Artoria mentions she wants to dream of a lion running across the plains. Kay then carves for her a wooden lion statue, one that could not possibly harm her in her dreams. When he presents the statue, Artoria believes it to be a cross between a dog and a cat. Regardless, she appreciates the effort and is able to have the dream she wished for. But Merlin watches over her, visiting her in her dreams to give her special lessons regarding the kingdom. She takes these lessons without emotion, not so much as questioning their purpose. While she contains the essence of the red dragon, she has a more personal affinity with lions after raising a lion cub for a month. At the age of 16, Artoria is sent to town to deliver Kay's lands and discovers that all of the knights of the realm have gathered for the selection of Britain's next king. Merlin has prepared a trial, lodging a sacred sword Caliburn, golden sword of the victorious, into a slab of rock and declaring, Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone is rightwise king of all England. Artoria watches Sir Kay as he attempts and fails in frustration to draw the sword. 
as night after night prove unworthy of the sword, the people begin to lose hope, and the knights leave to compete in jousting as a different method of deciding the victor. After all, none of them wish to become a saint, savior of Britain at their own sacrifice. The crowd moves to the arena, denying Merlin's prophecy and leaving Artoria alone with the Sword of Selection. She questions why she's been living her life pretending to be a man, Artorias. Learning swordsmanship, politics, reason, all the while suppressing her own desires. She understands that all her training has led up to this day, that she is the prophesized heir. For a brief moment, she imagines living life as an ordinary girl in the city, though she sets aside this desire to embrace the opportunity before her. Without hesitation, she grabs hold of Caliburn, but before she tries to pull it, Merlin asks her to think her decision through first. He warns her that by pulling the sword, she will no longer be human, detested by many, and ultimately experiencing a horrendous death. Brimming with a calm enthusiasm, Artoria pulls Caliburn from the stone, holding it high as Britain's next king. From this day on, her body no longer ages. Artoria is not the only child of Uther. Her older sister, Morgan Le Fay, is Uther's proper daughter, but has never received the same special treatment and grows up envying Artoria. Morgan thusly schemes against Artoria while hiding in seclusion. Artoria continues to conceal her gender so that none can question her rule. Rather, she hardly views herself as a woman in the first place. Sir Kay accepts his failure, and alongside Merlin, they accompany Artoria on various adventures as the first three knights of the Round Table. Rallying her people, Artoria fights eleven separate battles against the Saxons, leading from the front. Her charisma and bravery allow her to unite feudal lords and halt the advancement of northern Picts. She restores the castle of Camelot as an iconic city, gathering her best knights at the Round Table including Sir Lancelot, Gawain, Bedivere, Tristan, and Agravain. Among them, Agravain is considered second in command pertaining to the kingdom's policies. He is the son of Morgan Le Fay, initially placed at the round table through the influences of his mother in order to act as a spy and take down Artoria. He acknowledges Morgan's desire to usurp the throne, as well as the need for Britain's king to be strong but he actually finds Artoria to be the ideal candidate. Bedivere is the first of the knights to be externally recruited, serving as the steward of the royal court. He allies himself with Artoria out of admiration and a desire to see her true face and expressions. Naively, however, he never realizes his treasured king is a woman. Bedivere remains Artoria's most loyal knight, even in tense times. When Sir Bedivere finds himself inferior to the other knights in terms of strength and combat, Artoria comforts him by revealing she Bedivere's too feels inferior and like clarifies that each of her knights have important purposes beyond merely the sword. As an extension, she even goes so far as to sympathize with her invaders, acknowledging that they are merely seeking land to live upon. Though they are locked in combat much of the time, she reminds Bedivere that they don't fight to defeat evil but rather to ensure a bright future for their people. Sir Lancelot, the Knight of the Lake, hails from France, joining Artoria's knights after confirming rumors of her bravery and splendor. Generally, he is regarded as the strongest of the Knights of the Round Table and is highly adept at disguising himself. Lancelot's son, Sir Galahad, later joins the knights of his own merits. He serves as a pure and honest knight despite not getting along with his father. Sir Tristan, the Knight of Lamentation, joins the round table and performs admirably, but is at heart saddened, for the woman he loves is married to his uncle. Sir Gawain, the White Knight of the Round Table, serves as Artoria's right-hand knight, loyally fighting by her side without truly understanding her struggles. Merlin wishes to arm Artoria with a weapon powerful enough to defeat Vortigern. Thus, he escorts her I to obtain the, the Holy Lance, Longominia, a mere shadow of its true form 
as a pillar separating the world from the reverse side of the world. While not intended to be used as a weapon, Artoria equips the lands to slay her enemies with unbelievable light. Now prepared, Artoria leads her army and foreign tribes to confront Vortigern in his dragon form, breathing fierce flames. They fight for hours, until Artoria and Gawain manage to pin down the dragon with their swords. Artoria draws Rongominyad and harnesses its power to strike down the beast. Despite Vortigern's demise, Britain still struggles from drought and poverty, and its people criticize Artoria's efforts. For instance, in order to survive harsh seasons, she orders the dismantling of villages. Yet, by enduring ridicule, she is able to slowly improve the country's prosperity. Thus, she learns that, through her own suffering, Britain can be saved. Upon realizing this, Merlin reflects that he has made a mistake in raising her. She has become a king who does anything for her country, even at her own expense. He knows that this will ultimately cause her despair. Morgan sets a trap for Artoria during a training session, which results in Caliburn breaking and forever being lost. To cheer her up, Sir Kay again takes to making a wooden carving, this time of a bird catching a salmon. During her later travels, Artoria encounters Vivian, the Lady of the Lake, a phantasmal being known as a fairy. As an extension of the planet's will, Vivian is entrusted with guarding Excalibur, the Sword of Promised Victory, and its scabbard, Avalon, the ever-distant Utopia. Excalibur is a blade forged by the planet from the wishes of mankind, and Avalon is a sheath created by the fairies to accompany the Holy Sword. To replace Caliburn, Vivian passes Excalibur and Avalon onto Artoria. In the King's hands, the sword converts her mana into luminescent heat, and the scabbard grants her immortality. Much like Caliburn, this holy sword keeps her from aging. The Lady of the Lake also entrusts to Artoria Excalibur's sister sword, Excalibur Galantine, which derives its strength from the light of the sun. This sword is bestowed onto Gawain, for he is to carry on should Artoria perish. So that her country can have both king and queen, Artoria welcomes Guinevere to Camelot as her wife. Oh. They share no romantic love, but formally hold the relationship for Breton's sake. In truth, Guinevere is in love with Sir Lancelot, and the two have an affair, courting in secrecy. Torn between her love and her devotion to Artoria, oh. Guinevere is racked with oh, guilt fabulous. from her infidelity. Eventually, Artoria becomes aware of this affair, but does not condemn them. Instead, she keeps their affair a secret from the other knights. Through a letter, Artoria even forgives them and blesses their relationship, leading Lancelot into madness, unable to cope with his own guilt. Following tradition, it becomes a problem that Artoria cannot conceive a biological heir with Guinevere. Merlin accomplishes this task by using magecraft to temporarily make Artoria a pseudo-male, capable of producing sperm. To his fault, Merlin has a history of being a womanizer, and is seduced by Morgan Le Fay during this time. Morgan sneaks into the castle, enchants Artoria, and steals some of her sperm. Morgan cultivates this in her own womb, giving birth to a nearly identical homunculus clone of Artoria, named Mordred. Morgan hopes that Mordred will ascend the throne on her behalf. Mordred is sent to Camelot, clad in armor, and a helmet, secret of pedigree, that conceals her identity. Through merit, she is accepted as one of the Knights of the Round Table, and finds herself admiring Artoria's selfless nature. Morgan picks up on this, and, to instill action, reveals to Mordred that she is King Arthur's child. Thus, Mordred reveals herself to Artoria, demanding to be recognized as heir to the throne. Artoria considers the prospect, but reasons that Mordred is far too reckless and impulsive to rule the kingdom. Mordred is bluntly rejected, and the admiration she has for her king turns to malice. In order for her kingdom to prosper, Artoria sets out to eliminate all of Britain's overseas invaders. She continues to fight at the head of her forces, making bold decisions such as sacrificing villages for the war effort. Her killing is unrelenting, 
such that many come to fear and hate her. She is both praised and condemned for being the perfect king. Her fighting is ruthless, and her rulings are just and unwavering. These qualities strain her relationship with her knights. They cannot sense the humanity hidden behind her supposed perfection. Because she had been trained to become a knight her entire life, she has never lived like those she swore to protect. Artoria suppresses her human desires, her whims, and as such is criticized for being unable to understand the hearts of men. On the other hand, it is undeniable that she cares more for her country than any other king could. She understands that plowing the land, living day by day, and raising children lead to future prosperity. She knows that even if there is victory for the knights, or success in Camelot, there is always work to be done improving upon the kingdom's outer territories. Thus, she remains grim while her knights celebrate. Hers is a sacrificial rule. When she does smile, it is not for herself, but rather because her subjects are happy and healthy. Perhaps the one true flaw of King Arthur is her struggle to properly communicate these sentiments. Either way, this decline in faith leads Sir Tristan to resign his position at the round table. Britain's enemies are defeated, and the kingdom gains a temporary peace. Yet a new problem comes to focus. Britain, a land once prosperous with mana, is running scarce. To restore its flourishing mana, Artoria needs to retain a miracle, a product of true magic. Thus, she embarks upon a journey to seek the famed Holy Grail. This effort is spearheaded by Galahad, who is said to have obtained the Grail and returned it to the heavens. Thus, ultimately, this effort is in vain and more pressing political issues tear her from the search. Artoria sails out to Rome on a campaign to suppress their forces and ultimately form a peace treaty. Her battles are successful, but Avalon is stolen from her during the campaign, and trouble brews in her absence. Oh, Sir Agravain discovers the affair the between Lancelot and Guinevere, and uses this knowledge to threaten and mock Guinevere's purity. Agravain secretly despises women, both Morgan and Guinevere in particular. Enraged, Lancelot strikes Agravain down and flees to his homeland, killing many fellow knights in the process. Guinevere's affair is seen as treachery, and she is imprisoned, guarded on sight by Gawain's siblings, Gareth and Gaheris, so they may be by their queen. Lancelot comes to the rescue, killing the siblings and fleeing to France. Mordred takes advantage of this instability to steal her iconic sword, Clarend, raise a rebellion, and conquer Camelot. Artoria has been constantly warring, making great sacrifices for the kingdom. Her people cannot hold out long enough for conditions to improve. Mordred is able to form her army from that struggle, redirecting their suffering into hatred for Artoria. The King of Knights returns from Rome to encounter Mordred's army prepared for battle. For seven days, the two forces fight in the Battle of Camlon, forming a massive pile of corpses in their wake. Lancelot returns to the battlefield to assist Artoria, despite being excommunicated, but his assistance is rejected by Gawain, who is unable to forgive Lancelot for slaying his siblings. Sadly, this decision contributes to Artoria's downfall. Gawain himself is struck down by Mordred, and in that chaos, Artoria and Mordred meet face to face. Mordred yearns so to know why she was denied wine. the throne, why she wasn't acknowledged as Artoria's child. The two fight their last, with Mordred knocking Excalibur from Artoria's hands. Thus, she delivers her final attack with the spear, Rongo Minyad, incurring a fatal wound in exchange for Mordred's defeat. While it is far too late, Artoria assures that she never hated Mordred, and merely rejected her as an unqualified candidate for kingship. Mordred dies, and the battle comes to an end. Witnessing the tragedy that came from her lack of humanity, Artoria is heartbroken. She alone is meant to die tragically, yet so many others have suffered the same fate. The ending she has reached is not the one she seeks. To avoid this fate, she is willing to do anything. When the will of the planet calls out to her, she tosses aside her own salvation, her chance to die. In order to serve the counterforce, in exchange for the chance to seek the Holy Grail so she can relive her reign as king and steer Britain from destruction. Her body is then trapped in time 
remaining on the hills of Camlon. In preparation for the Fourth Holy Grail War, the Einsburn family obtains the lost Avalon and uses it as a catalyst for Kimitsugu ah, Emiya and Irisfiel to summon Artoria. At first, Artoria finds Kiritsugu's goal of world peace admirable, but is ultimately disgusted by his devious methods as an assassin. While she fights admirably to win the Grail, she is shocked to discover that one of her opponents, Berserker, reveals himself to be Sir Lancelot, now enraged because he was forgiven for his affair with Guinevere and consumed by guilt. In truth, he yearned for punishment, he yearned for the king's scorn. Sticking to her goal of obtaining the Grail, she slays Lancelot and reaches her final battle. At the end of the war, she finds herself losing to Gilgamesh and is ordered by Kiritsugu to use her remaining strength to destroy the Grail. For her, it is the ultimate betrayal. She unleashes her holy sword and fades from the era. At this point, her desire to revisit her time as king changes into a desire to redo the selection of the king entirely and have someone else ascend the throne in her place. She no longer feels worthy. As fate would have it, she is summoned into the next Grail War by Kiritsugu's adopted son, Shiro. He is an inept Magus who insists on sacrificing himself to save others. During the war, Artoria's pride as a warrior clashes against Shiro's selflessness. While she criticizes his disregard for his own happiness, she is hypocritical because she is no different. Unlike the previous war, Artoria and Shiro fight together as a team, and their endeavor together prompts her to reflect upon her reign as king, to accept what had happened and move on. Furthermore, Shiro probes her to confront her choice to become king and the life of a normal girl she left behind. They fall in love amidst the war's chaos, oh, this is from and Artoria is comforted to find out that her scabbard, Avalon, was used to save Shiro's life from the fire in Fuyuki ten years prior. To confront their final opponents, Shiro relinquishes Avalon to Artoria, which she uses while battling against her grandest opponent, Gilgamesh, and his reality-destroying Ea. Avalon deflects Gilgamesh's strike, allowing Artoria to strike him down with a point-blank swing of Excalibur. After discovering the Grail's corrupt true nature, the two of them destroy it. Before fading into the sunrise, Artoria formally declares her love for Shiro. No longer seeking the Grail, Artoria's pact with the planet comes to an end, and her spirit returns to her dying body in Camelot. After the Battle of Camlon, Sir Bedivere carries Artoria to a pure, sheltered forest and this hopes that she will recover. In her final living moments, she asks Bedivere to return Excalibur to the Lady of the Lake. In contrast, Bedivere cannot accept her death and knows that returning her sword is to affirm the end of King Arthur. Thus, two times, Bedivere returns, claiming to have deposited the sword. The king senses this and willfully insists Bedivere go back and do his duty. The third attempt is successful, and Artoria is at peace, silently dying beneath a tree. Her body is ceremoniously placed in a boat and sent off to sea, where it is said her soul will reach Avalon, a paradise where only the king may go in the afterlife. True to legend, Artoria's soul does make its way to Avalon after passing into the reverse side of the world. In honor of her kingship, a gravestone is erected in England, inscribed with the epitaph, Here lies Arthur, the once and future king. Avalon, meant to be an ideal utopia, is missing the one thing Artoria yearns for most. An eternity in paradise is nothing without Shiro, the one she loved in life. From this desire, Merlin advises Artoria to wait endlessly for Shiro, who will in turn pursue her endlessly. After what seems like forever, Merlin's prophecy holds true, and Shiro Emiya makes his way to Avalon to be reunited with the woman he fell for so long ago, with the vastness Ooh. of time Is separating them no the more. Shiro approaches Artoria and plainly declares, I'm back, Saber. Her breath is taken away. Finally, after so long, she has obtained her own personal happiness. The king can now become the girl she was never permitted to be. With a beaming, genuine smile, she responds, Yes, welcome back, Shiro.
and their souls spend eternity together in paradise. Okay guys, so that's the end of this video which is Fate Lore, the tale of Arthuria Pendragon and she's a very likable servant in Fate series because she's so beautiful, kind and loyal and also very powerful too. And after watching this video, I learned new information about this Arthuria Pendragon, especially about her parents and also about how she lost Avalon. And I think her story in Camelot and also the ending of its day night 2006 are so tragic. And if I can choose the ending for Arthuria Pendragon, I think I'm gonna choose the alternate ending of its day night unlimited bloodworks, which can be seen in the sunny day episode. Because in that episode, Rin prevents Saber from fading away and Saber finally can stay in the modern world with Chiro and Rin. And I think it's a very great and beautiful ending for Saber because finally she can live as a normal girl uh, and have a peaceful life and I think she deserves that. So thank you guys for watching my video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. See you again on my next video and take care.